Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty does work for you. This is Tom Navolis, your host, and I am just delighted that you're here with me again to discuss uh, the, the mirrors in history and the things that we see today that actually, as, as I've said before, nothing new under the sun. So what we have going on today uh, is exactly, as I've mentioned over and over again, uh, what we've seen before and, and experienced before, and that our founding fathers understood how to deal with it. So today, uh, we're not going to go down the, the mirror and path that uh, Samuel Adams would uh, bring to us, nor will we approach it from the perspective of the Anti-Federalist. Today, I, I do want to take the journey uh, very clearly through some of what the Federalists themselves had said. And th the fact of the matter is, is that what they had to say was absolutely uh, pertinent to what we've been hearing in the different debates, these presidential debates. And in particular, what I want to address is some of uh, the commentaries that came out of the most recent debate that was on uh, Fox uh, Business hosting uh, there in Wisconsin. Now, uh, I'm not, as you well know, a, a strong Republican, if you will. I think that there's a, a lot of very interesting principles that uh, they adhere to. Uh, I am a constitutionalist with that anti-federalist bent. And what I mean by that is that the anti-federalist argued that the Constitution, as it was written in uh, 1787, and then it went on uh, to the state conventions, could be perverted to the extent that it is today, and which I bring out during my seminars. So many of you that have heard the seminars and uh, know uh, what I've talked about in the tale of two constitutions clearly understand that what we have today by virtue of treaty, by virtue of uh, the different executive memorandum, and that we know that the Constitution, in effect, by virtue of law being enforced is not what the founders intended. And we see that we have people in the White House that have continued to pervert uh, what the founders intended, especially with this administration that we have right now. And uh, so just bringing you back to all of that and knowing that, uh, you know what, the Federalists actually had very, very good things to say. And we know that the Anti-Federalists were guaranteed that they would have a strong voice in the interpretation of the Constitution so as the perversions of the Constitution would be lessened. But most people don't study the Anti-Federalist papers, let alone the Federalist papers. So today, uh, what I would like to do is take you through just uh, several of the Federalist papers that are pertinent to what I think happened during those debates uh, this past week. And where I want to focus a bit is in the fact that we have this very large field of people. They, there's all of these different personalities. And not only that on the Republican side, but we have very strong and quite frankly perverse uh, personalities and people uh, that are running for the Democratic ticket. And what I mean by that is that we will hear from the founder, the framers themselves, these Federalist writers, being Hamilton, Madison, and Jay in particular, what we'll hear from them is that utopianism doesn't work. Utopianism is the same as socialism, is the same as what then became perverted into communism, and, and they clearly say that's not how our republic is supposed to function. So by virtue of that alone, and we'll discuss that a little bit later, is that the candidates that are running on the Democratic side uh, of the uh, opposition, if you will, uh, have no good interest from a constitutional basis. And uh, the, the Federalists talked about that. And so I want to try and get to some of that and bring that out. But first off, I think in general, I don't care who the candidates are. Uh, the first thing that I think that Hamilton in, in Federalist number one, if people would study just these first few 
uh, Federalist Papers that I'm going to, to cover today, if I get all the time uh, put together to do so, is that what we will see is that just even in the few Federalist Papers that it really brings out what we're contending with and that what the Constitution was supposed to do is to be able to protect us and protect the people in the context of a framework by which these multitudes of personalities would be vetted out. Now, we're not really seeing a good vetting process because, number one, the media doesn't know how to vet. Number two, the citizenry themselves do not know what a vetting process is about and what we should be looking for in those that would represent us at the national level. Not only the national level, but I think that the, the, the reality and the truths of republicanism and federalism, that they are, are very solid in their fundamental principles as to what the people should look like, what their character should be, what their values, their patriotism should be in representing us at any level of government from, as you've heard me say many times before, from the sewer board all the way up through the cemetery board, the water board, uh, your local townships, your city councils, your county councils, and then into your state legislatures, and finally into the federal system. Now, Hamilton in number one was, was very interesting in what he was talking about, what some of the prejudices would be against the Constitution. And, uh, and he, he says this, he says, among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new Constitution will have to encounter may readily be disguised and disgusted as the obvious interests of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may be hazard a diminution of their power, uh, an emulent, and consequences of the offices they hold under the state establishments. And not only that, that uh, the perverted ambition of another class of men who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by the confusions of their country or will flatter themselves with the fair prospects of elevation from one subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies than from its union under one government. I think that uh, Hamilton was just bringing out the realities of what we see in people that uh, don't have strong value systems and that the nature of man, and it was amazing that Hamilton even talked about it, is that the, the nature of man fundamentally is what he calls a sinful in not so many terms, but I mean, not even the simplest term, rather, but, but he talks about where people are at with that and, and that the, the whole idea is that these a ambitions and, and these antagonists, what happens is it creates an avarice. It has personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. So in any question, you have people that, that can be on either side of it. But the end, he sets up the idea, which all of the framers were really against party spirit, if you will, uh, and that you know, this is what would happen if you have that. So you have avarice, ambitions, you know, oppositions. And, uh, you know, when it comes to a question, and then were there not even these inducements of moderation, nothing could be more ill-judged than that intolerant spirit which has at all times characterized political parties. For in politics, as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. And yet, however just these sentiments will be uh, allowed to be, we have already sufficient indications that uh, it's going to happen. And in all cases, uh, it, it becomes a great national discussion. So he continues on in talking about these dangers and that, and that the hope and that the Constitution and its design was intended to temper 
this idea of party spirit, then what that would also do is bring in a stigmatization that would allow for despotic powers that would be hostile to the principles of liberty. An overscrupulous jealousy of danger to the rights of the people, which is more commonly the fault of the head uh, than of the heart, will be represented as a mere pretense and artifice. The state or the stale bait for popularity at the expense of the public good. It, it, it'll be forgotten. And then there's a jealousy that comes with this violent love that gets uh, wrapped around all of that, and then noble enthusiasms. And, and where is it about real liberty? What has happened to that? And what we have is just this illiberal distrust. And then on the other hand, it will be uh, forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty. You know, I guess when I heard Rubio and, and other comments talk about that, that one of the purposes of the primary purpose of the Constitution is to secure our liberty. And in doing so, we do have to have a strong national military to be able to do that. Now, there's a whole different uh, argument about what's a just war or unjust war. And as you've heard me say many times before, I think that we have not had a just war since the War of 1812. Everything after that has literally been driven by uh, the, the money changers, if you will, uh, the financiers, the international global banking uh, entities. So anyway, I'm getting off course here a little bit. Uh, Hamilton just kind of continues here that uh, in the contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interest can never be separate and that a dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the specious mask of zeal for the rights of the people than under the foreboding appearance of zeal for the firmness and efficiencies of government. Now see what we have going on, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I really believe under the ideas of utopianism that the uh, zeal, if you will, for the rights of the people are false with the Democratic Party. They're not about that. They're about power. They're about communism. They are about socialism. And um, you know what? It is that thing that gets manipulated or masked uh, as to the zeal for the rights of the people, but has nothing to do with it. So history will teach us that the uh, former has been found a much more certain road to the introduction of despotism than the latter. So you got that, that mask of zeal for the rights of the people is what he's talking about. And history teaches that it introduces despotism. And that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying uh, servitude or, or acting as a waiter or you know, trying to give something away that uh, those folks uh, try to court the people. And then commencing as demagogues, they end up as tyrants. That's what we have. You know, that's what we have with this hope and change. That's what we have in the national government right now is this whole idea of, okay, we're going to give you something, which is socialism. And, uh, you know, it ends up in tyranny, ends up in despotism, ends up in all those things that de Tocqueville talked about as well years later. But here we have John Jay talking about it, you know, right from the beginning. You know, he, he came into the idea that he was, you know, clearly of an opinion that the interest of the people would be to adopt this new constitution, and that he was convinced that it was the safest course for liberty, for our dignity, and our happiness. And so it, it just is interesting that you have to circle back and understand that uh, it was about the Constitution that would set that framework to protect us even from the ambitions within the political parties. So when we understand the fundamentals of even the Federalist paper, let alone the Anti-Federalist paper, then we get the correct idea of what we are supposed to have in our federal republic. Federalism, that which includes the states, and this republic that we have that is defined and brought to action through the Constitution. So as we get into some of the next segments here, uh, we'll be talking from uh, ideas that John Jay came up 
with as well as Madison that continues the discussion of what is important for us, how we build this nation, uh, how we retain our federal government, and uh, we'll continue on to what it means to have the wisest citizens elected here on Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalists got it correct. No, they got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalist got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. And this is your host, Tom Navolis. And again, I welcome you back and thank you for participating in the network as you have the opportunity to. We were finishing up last segment with uh, what Mr. Hamilton was talking about in relationship to why is it important to take and bring us together as a united country? He, he talked a little bit about you know, what is the whole purpose of government, and that being the security and the happiness of the people. And he also discussed the idea that, you know what, people are going to be sinful. They're going to be the whole purpose of some folks is just to take and become a despot and a tyrant and what that looked like. You know, we talked about that uh, in most cases that if uh, there is something that happens, it, it's more a fault of the head uh, than it is that of the heart. And then uh, it, it, he goes on to talk about you know, how the vigors of government are essential to the security of liberty. And that's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen, is liberty. I've talked before about the whole idea that you know, we have given up, especially in the, in the 20th and now in this early 21st century, the whole idea of liberty around uh, this other form of false security and worse yet, the idea of economy. Now, economy is important. We, we need to have that. But when economy becomes the focal point, then what you end up with is, uh, you know, greed. And greed then takes and drives all sorts of other human frailties, if you will. Well, Hamilton finished up uh, that uh, Federalist number one, and I wanted to jump in a little bit even into Federalist number two with John Jay. The interesting aspect that he talks about is that uh, there, it, it's indispensable and that government is indispensable. And that it's undeniable that when you institute government, that the people must cede some of their natural rights in order to vest it in that required power. Now, this goes back to the whole discussion and understanding, even from the Reformation period, on what are our natural rights, who grants those natural rights, and then as people form in society, how they come together and say, look, I know that I have the rights to a lot of different things, but I'm coming into society, and with that, there are a limited number of things that I am willing to come in and covenant with another person or group of people participate in for that mutual security, that, that, that mutual considerations of what it would take to uh, bring a people group together. And that's what we are. And, and Jay talks about that, is that uh, it's well worthy of a consideration, therefore, whether it would uh, you know, conduce more to interest and more to the interest of the American people that they should, to all general purposes, be one nation under one federal government. Then they should be divided up into uh, themselves or into separate confederacies. Uh, it, and, and then he comes on to saying that, you know what, it, it is the absolute opinion that the prosperity of the people in America depends on being firmly united. You see, and that's what we have to have. And as I've been talking in my other last three programs about how immigration, especially illegal immigration, leads to tyranny, if we are not united and we are not united in the proper format that I'm going to talk about in a moment, then you know what? There, there is no unity in the nation. As a matter of fact, what we're finding 
with this uh, existing administration is that they're trying to be absolutely divisive. And the things that are happening on the college campuses now are absolutely divisive. Uh, I'll tell you again, ladies and gentlemen, that when you get a chance, go online, go to Amazon.com and pick up the book, None Dare Call It Treason, 25 Years Later by John Stormer. In there, as well as in the book The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen, is the whole list of what the communists intended for America. And part of it is the takeover of the educational system, especially at higher education. So it's well, well documented in Stormer's book how the communists have done that in the public educational colleges, universities. And uh, what we're seeing on campuses, once again, is being manipulated by uh, these people that have a different agenda that is not to maintain our security nor develop what we need as America, as a strong and prosperous nation. Well, Jay kind of continues on to the whole thing that it, it has until lately been received an uncontradicted opinion that the prosperity of the people of America depends on their, current, on, on their continuation to be firmly united, that the wishes and prayers, the efforts of our best and wisest citizens have been constantly directed to that objective. But politicians now appear who insist that this opinion is erroneous and that instead of looking for the safety and happiness in the Union, we ought to seek a division of the states into distinct confederacies or sovereignties. But I want to stop there because what we have going on with the Tenth Amendment movement is not to some of the extent of what he was talking about. There were those that were very, very strong federalist, if you will, and looking at federalism, if you will, that the states do have some sovereign authority, and they should. And even under this Constitution, that was the argument, is that the state should have some sovereignty within the context of a larger framework. And uh, it, it's an interesting uh, you know, discussion around that whole process of what is federalism. So Jay kind of continues through that whole process in, in Federalist Number 2. He talks about that. He talks about what uh, the advocates are looking at from uh, ideas of character. And uh, he really brings it to bear that it certainly would not be wise in the people at large to adopt uh, these new political uh, tenets without being fully convinced that they are founded in truth and sound policy. Well, folks, that we ha that's what we have to have in every form of legislation today, is that the people have to be fully convinced that they're founded in truth and sound policy. And we're not getting that. And, and, and people don't understand what is the truth because most people, and again, I'll use the kids on the college campuses, have no clue of our historical background. And I have to you know, say, in particular, the Democratic candidates have no clue of our true foundational background. And, uh, you know, there's a few of the uh, candidates on the Republican side that don't get it. They, 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 they think they know or they're following the Constitution as it is, not as it was intended, and therefore uh, they are manipulating the way that policy is functioning under the false pretenses of truth, because they don't understand the truth, as Jay is talking about it and laying it out. Now, it, it's have, uh, often given uh, John Jay pleasure to observe that the independent America was not composed of detached and distant territories, but that one connected, fertile, widespreading country was the portion of our Western Sons of Liberty. Providence, meaning God, has in a particular manner blessed it with a variety of soils and productions and water with innumerable streams for the delight and the accommodation of its inhabitants. A success of navigable water uh, forms a kind of chain around its borders, and if so uh, bound together, while the, you know, the most noble rivers in the world are there, running at convenient distances presents it with the highways for easy communications of friendly aids and the mutual transportation exchange of their various commodities. The rivers have always been in America that first and foremost means of what? Transportation, communication, 
uh, you know, moving of all of our uh, commodities. So Jay continues that with equal pleasure, he's often taken notice that, again, God has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs, and who by their joint councils, arms, and efforts fighting side by side throughout a long and bloody war, have nobly established their general liberty and independence. Now, folks, this goes back into what later then becomes that whole conversation, or over the past three weeks, was a conversation regarding illegal immigration. The intent of the founders was, and has always been, that we are one people, we're of one language, we're of a commonality, a commonality that takes and unites us, yes, we, we may have folks that come in from all different nations legally, but the intent is, is that they come to understand our customs. They understand that it is a Christian nation or was supposed to be a Christian nation uh, that, you know, in understanding our language, then we had the same attachments to the principles of government. You cannot have an attachment to the principles of government unless you understand the customs and history of that government and you understand it through a common language. We have so much divisiveness, and it's not only in Hispanic speaking, it's in other Slavic languages. It's in the multiple languages that are here in America and the people, whether they're refugees or they are illegals, that are not getting it. They don't understand what it means to be a common people. And that's what John Jay was talking about. This country and its people seem to have been made for each other. And it appears as if it was the design of providence, that is the design of God, that an inheritance so proper and convenient for a band of brethren united to each other by the strongest ties should never be split into a number of unsocial, jealous, and alien sovereignties. Similar sentiments have hitherto prevailed among all the orders and denominations of men among us. To all the general purposes, we have uniformly been one people, each individual citizen everywhere enjoying the same national rights, privileges, and protection. You know, Jay talks about us being an intelligent people, that, you know, we're, we're, we're perceived that even though we're intelligent, we, we still have some defects. And uh, still continuing to the fact that we want to be a union and that we're enamored with liberty, that we observe the dangers which immediately threaten the former and more remotely the latter, and being persuaded that the ample security for both could only be found in a national government more wisely framed than they as with one voice, convened the late convention in Philadelphia to take an important subject under consideration. Now, that was part of the, of the rationale to come together. You know, that wasn't the real reason uh, in totality that the convention of 87 came together, but it was an idea that, hey, you know what? We needed to come up with some strong, common uh, form of governance, and that how that would work within then the framework of federalism in a republic, a represented constitutional republic. So what we have is that this constitution was then referred to the people, uh, referred to the bodies and recommended in, in the different measures to provide uh, that the bodies that would come together as the state conventions would have wisdom, and that uh, there would be a lot of uh, good memories pressed together, and that uh, communications would come through either weekly papers or pamphlets or something that would have uh, strong affections toward what needed to be as this constitutional republic. 
Now, it's worthy to remark that we needed to uh, come together as a people and that it would be for universal and uniformity in the attachment of the union rest greatly on weighted reason. And so the only way that this could happen is that if we were sincerely and clearly understanding of what it meant to be a good citizen and that when we would be here as a nation, that we would be that one people, one language, one customs, one culture, all in all, for one nation under God. Come on back for the last segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. This third segment here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host, Tom Navolis. Oh boy, I, I was really hoping to be able to get into more of the Federalist Papers and regarding uh, in relationship to the, oh, the debates, the Republican debates that were on Tuesday night and uh, some of the areas that uh, were covered in there. And I, I guess I'm going to be somewhat stuck on that section about our national security. And uh, it was interesting, as much as I really don't care for Mr. Rubio, uh, for a lot of different reasons, he did come out very strongly with, uh, we have to have a strong military. Now, that being interesting from the perspective that uh, John Jay continues in his remarks in uh, Federalist Number 3, that in his observations that uh, if Americans are intelligent and well-informed, uh, that they would seldom adopt and steadily preserve for many years the appropriate type of, of government and not an erroneous uh, opinion respecting interest that uh, considerations naturally tend to create great respect for you know, the uh, highly uh, educated individuals or the high opinions of people in America so long as there is the uh, uniformly entertained of the importance of their continuing firmly in one federal government and that uh, we appropriately then vest the powers in that federal government. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have two questions is that although there may have been like 14 million people that tuned into the Fox News debates, uh, quite frankly, that doesn't mean that we have an informed electorate in, in general. We can go out there and ask people questions every day about our, our form of uh, government, and you will get answers of from I don't know to maybe it's this or it's a democracy. or you know, and Even now, these kids in college are saying, oh, yeah, they'll accept socialism and communism. They will accept totalitarianism. That's what they've been prepared for. Well, that's not what our founders intended. He intended they, in general, intended us to be wise. And he, being Jay in particular, wanted us to have a real objective view so that we were a wise and free people that find it necessary to direct our attention. That of providing for our safety seems to be the first order of government. The safety of the people doubtless has relation to a great variety of circumstances and considerations and consequently affords great latitude to those who wish to define it precisely and comprehensively. Wow, that's pretty interesting compared to today's environment where they'd rather put out these bills of thousands of pages uh, that then... You, you can't define anything precisely nor comprehensively. And the comprehensively didn't mean a thousand pages. Comprehensively meant keep it simple. The legislation should be, you know, one, two, three, four, no more than five pages long. And if you're putting a whole bunch of other junk in there, then guess what? That's exactly what it is. It's junk. So Trans-Pacific, even the you know, Homeland Security, a lot of these other types of legislation that we have here, besides Congress care, is a bunch of junk because it's not simple to understand, comprehend. It's not precise and not comprehensive in that context. So anyway, and, and Jay went on to talk about that uh, he only means to consider it as uh, respects the security for the preservation of peace and tranquility, as well as against dangers from foreign arms and influences as from 
dangers of the like kind arising from domestic causes. Ladies and gentlemen, when he's talking about here from the dangers from foreign arms and influences, that's talking about the lobbyists, that's talking about the illegals, that's talking about preserving our nation in a format that allows us to have peace and tranquility internally. And so that means even against any type of uh, internal uprisings that would be contrary to the forms of our federal system, our Republican system, and how that works. So he goes on to talk about how wars and, and, and all of these different things would happen and that, you know, some of it is to keep from any type of internal issues and that that was part of what the national government was all about. And, and it was to generally appoint people that would be able to come and, and assemble in such a manner that we had a larger perspective versus just what would happen if the individual states tried to come together with that or if the states tried to come together as a couple states. So there were a lot of issues that under the national government, treaties and articles of treaties, as well as the law of nations, will always be expounded in one sense and executed in the same manner, whereas adjudications on some points and questions in the 13 states or in the three or four confederacies that were being talked about will not always accord or be consistent. And that, as well as from a variety of independent courts and judges uh, that are appointed by different and independent governments, as from different local laws and interests, which may affect and influence them. So, trying to bring some continuity even into the legal system. John Jay was all about that, that's for sure. I mean, that, that's one of the things that when he sat on the Supreme Court, he was intent on making sure that the Constitution brought that equity and justice crossed uh, into our federalism in such a manner that you know we had the higher courts not only from an appellate perspective but also that the states would not take and try and develop various laws that then would impede uh, the liberties and securities of the people uh, within the context of other states and uh, so you know he, he goes on to talk about the governing parties and the temptations uh, that they have in uh, taking and, and causing issues, you know, to form all these different circumstances that would be particular or par particular to uh, a, a state or a group. I mean, this is where, we're, again, we have to talk about the lobbyists. Lobbyists were never intended to be a part of this national government. So that was the whole idea of maintaining uh, consistency without the perversion from outside sources. Uh, so far, therefore, as either designed or by accident uh, violations of treaties and the laws of nations afford just causes of a war. So if you're going to have a war, it has to be a just cause for war. And unfortunately, we are so treated up that we aren't the nation that our framers intended us to be, and, and treaties aren't what they were intended to be, and, and executive agreements were never intended to be the, the, the weight of a treaty. So when we talk about even, uh, as he was talking about, on the course of war, it becomes very, very interesting that uh, we look at things from that perspective of a just war and not from the perspective of people that all of a sudden get a bird in their saddle and uh, they want to go to war and, and what are all the different causes. But uh, here, he talks about this. But not only fewer just causes of war will be given by the national government, but it will also be more in their power to accommodate and settle them amicably or amicably. Um, they will be more temperate and cool, and in that respect, as well as in others, will be more in capacity to act with circumspection than the offending states, being the, the foreign states. The pride of the states, or which in this case he's talking about the 13 states, as well as of men, so the pride of men, naturally disposes them to justify all their actions and opposes their acknowledging, correcting, or repairing their errors and offenses. Boy, isn't that true? So he goes on to talk about that the national government in such cases will not be affected by this pride, 
but will proceed with moderation and candor to the consideration decided on the means that are most proper to the ext uh, extricate uh, what we needed to uh, see happen in a national power. Um, Jay talks about a number of different things in this regard. He talked about, you know, again, human nature and that it has a tendency to cause things to happen, to cause wars, and it out of, oh gosh, uh, let's see, he's talking about, but the safety of a people of America against dangers from foreign force depends not only on their forbearing to give just causes of war to other nations, but also on their placing and continuing themselves in such a situation as not to invite hostility or insult, for it need not be observed that there are uh, pretended as well as just causes of a war. And it is true, however, disgraceful it may be to human nature that nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it. Nay, that absolute monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it, but for purposes and objects merely personal, such as a thirst for military glory, revenge for personal affronts, ambition, or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans. These and a variety of other motives, which affect only the mind of the sovereign, often lead him to engage in wars not sanctified by justice or the voice and interests of the people. So we see a lot of that. We see that, in my opinion, the last number of wars, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, were bankers' wars, especially what we have today, Afghanistan and all of that. Yeah, we, we covered over with the guise of terrorism, and are there a bunch of bad guys out there? Absolutely, without question. But in effect, you know, sadly as it may sound, not that I agree with um, Mr., um, what's his name, Ryan, that or, 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 or not Ryan, but Mr. Paul, that, uh, you know what, we needed to be more considering of why we went to war. Do we have bad guys that we have to deal with now? Absolutely. But you want to know something? If we would take and stop the jihadists coming into the country at our borders, you know, we might be able to do more by protecting our borders and making sure that we are secure within our own nation. And it goes back to what Hamilton and Jay and you know, uh, had talked about at the at the very beginning. So, you know, we come down to this whole uh, perspective is that we have to pay attention to who we are, what we are, and what we're doing. Um, we don't want to be a divided people. We want to be a unified people, and we have to have those areas that uh, will unify us. And that means we need a common language. People need to understand our customs, and they absolutely need to understand our mode of government and what it means to self-govern. And it needs to be a self-governance under a greater uh, governor, that being the God of heaven. And under that understanding, then we can have a better context within our, in our generalized government. So, you know, we, we, we can continue on with a, a number of these uh, simple papers. And I do want to jump over quickly and see if I can summarize a couple things with Madison. Because what he talks about is that the um, most, uh, he, he, he was talking about property and how important property is to us in America and how important property is also for the administration of good governance. And it's hard to get into this in detail because I think there's so much there in the uh, Federalist Number 10, which Madison wrote, and that uh, some of the things that, uh, just real quick summary, is that uh, we need to, uh, going over what to avoid the dangers uh, of government coming apart, that what we have to have is uh, stopping the instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils that have, in truth, been the mortal diseases under which popular governments have everywhere else perished as they continue to have the favor of fruitful topics from which adversaries to liberty derive their most specious declamations. The valuable improvements made by the American Constitution on the popular models, both assent and modern, 
cannot certainly be too much admired, but it would be an unwarrantable uh, partiality to contend that they have effectually uh, obviated the danger of this side and was wished and expected. So complaints are everywhere, and they're heard, and, and, and you have to take into consideration that the virtuous people help put all of this together. And it really comes down to that we need to maintain our property as well. And that was part of the purpose of government, is to ensure that we, the people, have our private property and that it's kept in a manner that allows us to move forward as a common people in this great nation. And then we'll come back next week with Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty works for you. For you.